Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 68 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with my partner, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome back, listeners. Uh, minute, Zaki, it's been several minutes, as you like it's, to say. I like to say it's been a minute, but you haven't caught on to the parlance. I, I haven't. I'm, You're I'm, not hip to the parlance. I'm, I'm not. But anyway, it's been a minute, and uh, uh, I guess Eid Mubarak, Happy Eid, belated for those who celebrate. Um, we've just been unable to scheduling various reasons. Haven't been. We don't like up. each other. Yeah, there you that's go. Also, there's, there's, that's a big there's, problem. There's a, we are we are like Laverne and Shirley in the last season of Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> you like and, you like Martin. And on that oh, comedy yeah. note, yeah, yeah, yeah. And on that comedy hey, like, note, we like Martin got, and Gina, yeah. we can't be in the same yeah. scene. Yeah. Is that they didn't? They were they didn't like each other. Oh, it was weird, bro. It was weird. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was just really, really weird. But that just shows you the power of money. It's like this is how we're gonna work it out. <laughs> it's very funny because like a week ago, I was on YouTube and I was just completely random. I was looking at the intros of Martin. Just over the years, and, oh. but you know, seeing who was on. Has someone done like a compilation or something? Yeah, you know, yeah, season yeah, yeah, one, season yeah, two, yeah. and season three. It's like Martin Lawrence, blah, 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 and Tisha Campbell. You know, oh. like she she didn't want anything to do with him. So yeah, yeah she, it was it was, yeah. it was uh, again. I'm using Laverne and Shirley, which is like yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know why I'm using the Laverne. Shlemiel, Shlemazel. All right, yes. <laughs> and that <laughs> voice you're hearing, by the way, that yeah. is Preacher Moss, who's hey, our hey. guest. For this episode, thank you so much for uh, we are. I was going to say for hanging out with us, but the truth yeah. is, we're hanging out with you yeah. in in uh, your uh, hotel room here in the mm. Bay Area. So. That's right. First of uh, all, yeah, and welcome to the Bay. Welcome, what good what to brings you, you to the Bay Area, yeah. man? Um, wow, I'm doing my own comedy special. It's called Love Supreme Anatomy of Gratitude, mm. which is um, it's really a long form comedy, which I think has been missing, mm. uh, particularly in. A, in a, yeah, and the Muslim vibe in terms of art and um, for the inartful, I guess, or those who aren't in the know, how would you define long term, long, long, long form comedy, as opposed yeah. to what stand up comedy, or as opposed to what? Like, it's truth, it's truth telling. Hmm. You know, it's that space in between where you can you can go between the joke and you can tell people. You know, these are the colors of the joke. This is what it really means. Like, mm. if anybody ever got a chance to watch Dick Gregory. He'd do a three-hour show yeah, because he'd give you the laughs, but he'd give you, like, these just really intimate details of what society was really going on about. Like, uh, prime example, he came to see a show of mine, an Allah Made Me Funny show in D.C. several years ago. Wow, what an honor. And what was, you know, I'd known him before. You know, that was my mentor. He kept me in the comedy game when I was going to quit. Um... And he surprised me because he was in D.C. He was going to come out and see all made me funny. I told him about it like five or six years before it happened. This is what I'm thinking. He comes out to see the show and I had this joke um, about political parties. Okay. About how there were so many political parties. You got Democrats, you got, you got Libertarians, you got the Republicans. I said, you got the... Green Party. I said, you got the Green Party. Yeah. I said, you got, you got the, the... At the time, I said, you got the, the Tea Party. I said, for black people that are self-hating, can't get into the Tea Party, they have the Sweet Tea Party. And uh, he came up to me after the show. And he's like, I want, I, want the, I, want the, I want the rubrics of that joke. I want everything hmm. about that joke. And he was like, De- deconstructing the joke but he was telling me one of the failures of the black medical intellectual communities that we haven't been able to form a political block mm. and so imagine getting lectured because he's got all these years I mean at, at that time he was just turning 80 wow mm. so he's like let me give you all the details from when there was Martin when there was Mega when there was Malcolm let me tell you it's like so you know me thinking of this joke it has layers to it but not layers like that yeah. Mm. Yeah. not layers like that like I, I wanted people ask me yeah, I know you got a bunch of jokes about Trump I'm like Trump I'm like no man I really don't have jokes about Trump I have truth mm. about Trump and uh, the truth is funny in some regards but some of it, some of it is like yo man this is you gotta have a strong will to come out and see my show because it's not you know, there's a difference between being a, a comedian and a clown. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you run that line. But I'm like, you know, people need to hear things, you know, because voices are muted now. And, you know, you, you, there's an old joke they used to say, uh, how do you keep Jews out of the country club? Hire one Jew, he keeps the others out. 
Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that's the way it's become with comedy, particularly mm-hmm. with Muslim comedy. You know. Can you can you expand on that? That's fascinating to me. Well, a person gets into a position and they tell you, "Hey, you're this and you're that and you're this and you're that," and you you know, and they say, "But well, that guy right there, this person, what they're saying, we don't like it." But then they turn it into, it can threaten what we're doing for you. It can mm. threaten what you've built. It can threaten your support. You know, mm. we can control whether you move left, whether you move right. You know, one of my first, I've told the story a couple times. I, I told all the comedians, oh, "I'm gonna be funny." It's a, you know, everybody has that that one meeting, where they basically ask you, you know, are you willing to sell your soul? And. Uh, mm. I was with an agent. I don't even mind. I don't even mind saying his name. His name was Jeff Chetty. He was with uh, Brillstein Gray. Sure. And Dale Hammond from Saturday Night Live. He got me the. Uh, he got me the meeting, and this is a big meeting, man. And I walked in. And I'm telling him all this stuff, and he's yeah, 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 yeah. And it was like you know, this one had the best damn sports show back then. It was uh, coming, okay. Yeah. So he was like, yeah, well, I think we can get you on this and this. And he goes, you Muslim? I go, yeah. So let me ask you a question. And he goes. Uh, so if you had a chance to make a whole lot of money or, you know, make like social change, you know, what would you do? And I'm like, well, you know, money's good. You got to feed your family. Da, da, da. I said, but, you know, change is important. I said, that's what my heart is, you know. And he said, all right, thanks for coming. Wow. wow. Huh. You know, your meeting is short when they don't have to validate your parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that was yeah. it. And I realized at that point, mm-hmm. um, if I was going to continue doing what I was doing, it was going to be an organic thing. So, and all that made me funny couldn't happen in Hollywood. I had to leave Hollywood and start it. I couldn't even start in that shit. Right. I'd have a relationship with some of the clubs to bring out people out to show that we had a particular type of value that you couldn't really control. Hmm. So it's like, you know... Well, I, I think therein lies a lot of the challenges for you as, as an artist, as a Muslim artist, specifically perhaps as a Muslim comedian, is on the one hand, all of the meeting that you just mentioned with your agent, you've got that kind of ceiling beyond which, unless you're willing to sell out, you might not be able to break. And then on the other hand, within the Muslim community, there are certain things that you wouldn't be able to get away with talking about in a mosque. Or, you know, where so you, ha- you, ha- you kind of have to take it out of that quote unquote space in order to have that well, now conversation. It's, now it's, it's tricky. Mm-hmm. It's tricky this way. Because you can, you can take out profanity, all that type of stuff. Okay. There are just some ideas that people don't want to hear. That's what I mean. Yeah. Right, right. When I first started, no one wanted to hear anything about racism. No one want to hear about racism. You're talking about Muslim audiences. Yeah. Muslim audiences did not want to hear about racism. Within our community. Yeah, without our That's community. Right. Which is and substantial, they would tell you, by the way. Yeah. And they would tell you, you know, there's no Islam, and they give you the same. Uh, the same. Yeah. Uh, there's no the white over. The spiel. There's no blue black. The and I was sticker. like. Yeah. The, the brochure. Yeah. yeah. And the brochure. Like, there's no W. Muhammad over the nation of Islam. I would just be a jerk, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure. But I'm like, I'm seeing it, and I'm like, I'm worried because... You're seeing it, but you can't. You can't say. It, you can't articulate it because yeah. it's an omission at some point in time. Hmm. Like I talk mm. about Trump, but I, yeah. I I talk about Trump, but I'm talking about Trump from a totally different perspective, which is I understand evolution and growth with children. See, everything I've done in terms of all that made me funny, it was all based for the youth. Hmm. Well, can talk about talk about your perspective on Trump because I'm sure people listening are kind of like oh, well more. there's a difference between practicing politics and, and, and black folks say you either you, you're not practicing practicing politics you're practicing mm-hmm. magic hmm oh I thought you were going to say politics but okay politics but you, yeah you're practicing Except magic for, uh, I mean have you really ever looked at some of the people if you put them a split screen and where they were before Trump became president and they were scared of them to where they are now hmm I mean, yeah. He, uh, yeah. certainly a lot of the Republicans who were on that Sarah, stage. Sarah Huckabee looks like she's drugged. Hmm. You ever see that? Like, give us the truth. Well, da da. I hmm. mean, it's 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 weird. It's a cult, man. Drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah, it's like the Republican version of of, of Jim Jones. Hmm. Except you don't have to get on the plane and go to Guyana. 
Okay, the, the Kool Aid is right here. Yeah, but how does that happen? Well, I, mean, I think it happens two ways. I think it happens two ways. Number one, you have to get folks to imagine, and this is maybe long form or whatever. Here in America, we think that these are the best and brightest people because they tell us they're the best and brightest people. But if you do your homework, um, the people came over from England and Europe. You know, they were sent over. Mm-hmm. And, and and the Europeans, they didn't send us the best and brightest. They sent these are white people that white people didn't want. <laughs> and so what kind of government do you think is going to be established here? What kind of moral foundation do you think is going to be established here? Mm-hmm. Wow. You flip the whole thing, think about African Americans that come over here. You know, it was the strongest and, and, and the, the, the deepest will who wanted to survive and adapt when they got here. Mm-hmm. That's very true. So you look at the balance and fascinating. No one wants to put those things in a fair fight. Hmm. You know, th- th- there's never been a fair fight for minorities in the United States. Well, y- you speak about the Black American experience, and I can't help but interject, like, say, the experiences of like my parents were Zuckies, right? Where we're kind of in the middle there because, on the one hand, you know, I would argue that to a certain extent they represented a cert- they represented an, an, an elite from in their own home countries, whether mm-hmm. it's the Middle East or certainly the subcontinent, they came here for higher education or they were already educated and they came here for um, social mobility. Mm-hmm. And then, but, and then secondly, so, so th- th- hence that they're not completely like the European immigration that you, that you spoke of early on. And yet they're not entirely obviously like, or they're not at all like the African American experience because they weren't brought here involuntarily. Right. They came here voluntarily. So, that the immigrant experience, which is obviously very, very much in the, what is it, in the ether right now, in the conversation happening right now around immigration, hmm. is is kind of interesting there because we're not, we don't fit the European model of immigration, nor do we fit the the, the African model. I think you touched on something. Okay. Um, and as a, I consult for the NFL, and I've had this. Wow. So you know, it's funny because you're this episode follows our last episode with Ahmed Nassar. Mm-hmm. So you, uh, you, you, yeah, yeah. You're familiar with from right. NFL. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's it's fascinating that you bring in you, you bring in the NFL because we had that conversation just last just on the last show. Anyway, please. No, I, I think so you touch on something. Okay. And I think it gets overlooked. Please. It's a scope of social social mobility. If you look at the recent um, ruling from the Supreme Court, it's not about a Muslim ban. It's about mobility, being able to control. Right. Mobility. And for the listeners, we're literally recording this the day after that ruling from the Supreme Court and the day that Justice uh, Stevens announced that he would be... Kennedy. Sorry, Kennedy <laughs> announced that he would be uh, don't, leaving. Don't, don't yeah, get ahead of your... By the I time know. you listen to this, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's been that kind of week. It has. Sorry. So I don't want to cut you off, but I, I just want to mention... Yeah, I want to drop that absolutely. out there because I do, these are conversation threads that I want to pick up on for our listeners. So please, sorry. So you Finish had this, point. yeah, you uh-huh. had this whole thing, and it's really about social mobility, which, you know, we were just talking about <laughs> the uh, the whites that Europeans sent over here with white people that white people didn't want. So I, I metaphorically, I look at Trump supporters somewhat as indentured servants, meaning that <laughs> to who to the GOP to or to the establishment. I would say to the game. You know, uh, to, yeah, just, well, right. yeah, because basically, to the uh, game, to the man, to the to, establishment, to the whatever, right? To yeah. the, okay, to the you know, I think the thing is, people say you say the man, the black man goes, eh, the man, no, 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 the no. white man has to do with that's the man a, too. Yeah, 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 that's what I'm saying. But they, but they, they will never say that. So you well, have this they have to deal with the man, especially I would argue poor whites who, let's say, let, 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 let's uh, be real, but, it, were the vast majority of people who did vote for Trump. Yeah, well. Poor and, whites have it as bad. I would maybe not as bad, but they have it no, certainly I, I worse off than their whites. Ex- they have extremely bad, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you I, agree. This, this is why they have it extremely bad because if you look at laws and, and, and constitution, you know it was designed to support this thing called just just white sustainability. Sure. Mm-hmm. And they wake they woke up basically. That's why they hated Obama. Because Obama was very intellectual, and he let you kind of know who you were. They just, some people just woke up one day, oh, you know what? We, we've had 
busting slavery, da da da. We had these advantages. We should be here. We're here. And mm-hmm. someone woke up and go, you know what? Damn, this is the best. This the best it might be. Mm-hmm. This is the best it may get. Wow. And we're not even talking yeah. about my 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 children. Yeah. I can't even go tell my kid this. This is as good as it's gonna get. See the thing about African Americans and mm-hmm. immigrants and something like that. You know, in that space, you know, we 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 recognize the ceiling, but we just go let's go break through that ceiling. Hmm. Or we recognize the ceiling, we can't break through. Like, you know, we're just gonna build our own house. Mm-hmm. That was that was the Negro baseball league and mm. things like that, and and, and the bar and storm and right. basketball teams. It's like we knew how to do that. I praise the Lord. Hey man. There's no Muslim representation out here. Muslim comedy, not even Muslim comedy back in 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 '99, in, in 2000, before 9/11 happened. It was like our people aren't shown in a space where they are enjoying themselves. They, they self-validate themselves in a public way. I'm gonna do all that make me funny. So it was like, where's the tour? There's no tour. I left Hollywood. I'm like, you know what? I left Hollywood after uh, the George Lopez show. Came in. I'm like, you know, what do we do? And it's like, you know what? There's a there's a blueprint here. You're just putting entertainment to it. You have to build that. Right. And it was a perfect opportunity for me because it's like nobody's going to see this coming. I'll put it out there, and we'll build our own house. Right. You know. And then eventually you'll have people going. You know what? I like that house. I want to own that house. You know. You <laughs> they right. say, how do we? How can I get that house? Which has been as the scope of immigrant social mobility because they say, yeah, we're going to give you these jobs. But there's a caveat. Oh, yeah. There's a caveat. It's like, okay, cool. Well, you know how this goes. We don't like this. We don't like... I joke about, you know, the next Supreme Court ruling is going to be about how many times a Muslim can pray. You know, you know, five is too much. Hmm. You know, what about three? Three and a half? Can we do three and a half? Right. And there'll be some Muslim going, yeah, I could do three and a half. <laughs> right. Sure. So yeah, Trump right. has basically reintroduced the idea of house Muslims and field Muslims. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about that exact, I, that sort of idea of, that Malcolm talks about, obviously, the, the, the house Negro, the field Negro demarcation, and you bringing that up. And that's a really interesting point. Um, where were we, man? There's so many sort of threads to, to pick up on. Sorry, man. No, 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 no it's fine. Good. They're all good but threads. Z- Zucky, I mean, you and I were talking about this before the show, but, I mean, even the election of Trump, we... I think you said it, and I agree. Didn't have us as concerned as what not only with yesterday's rulings, but also with today's announcement of Justice Kennedy. And, and so, why do you say you find yourself in a spot where you're even more concerned than you were on November? Uh, you know, 8th? I, I think for me, the thought I had, I was because I was thinking about this. I was like, up up to this moment. We've clung to maybe a maybe a made up hope, but the idea that the the levers of of, of power, the the structures of government, will impede this, mm-hmm. right? And we're at a point now where it's like the sudden realization that there's no one coming to help. Yeah. Superman isn't flying in to save Lois Lane. Like this is we're we're in we're in it now, and. Again, you know, because I, I can speak to the fact... I know people who voted for Trump, and they justified their vote. They said he's terrible, mm. but if he's too if he's too off the rails, Congress will impeach him, which is ridiculous, obviously. And I said, what are you, are you kidding me? Right? But this was the hope yeah, that people yeah, constructed yeah, yeah, yeah. in their head. And and notwithstanding those people, even people who didn't vote for Trump still had it in their mind. Like, you know, it's funny. Just uh, before I came here, I was I saw on, on Saturday Night Live. It was a, on YouTube. It was a Saturday Night Live sketch from like a year ago, mm-hmm. where it's like this is about the heroic Republican who stood up to his own party. His name was TBD, and the joke is there's nobody like that, you know. And I'm like a year later, that joke is even sadder slash funnier because it's so entirely true, so right? Entirely true. And and we see. I, I mean, you know, uh, we, when you look at the court specifically, right? You say, okay, well, Gorsuch is terrible he's proven to be terrible and the way he got the seat is terrible but you say if nothing else you say well the balance of the court did not fundamentally change because he just filled the Scalia slot right Right. now Kennedy as even though I disagree with the notion that he's a a swing justice but whatever but that's been the narrative that's the narrative well let's do we honestly think another swing justice of course not I I said something you know Trump uh 
Trump in 2018 puts me squarely in this narrative. And it's, almost, it's religious, it might be, it's not heresy, but it's religious. It's like, he constantly reminds me that, that there's no more messages coming. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> wow. So there's no more messages. All you get is reminders mm. that you should have wow. listened to the messages. Huh. So you had King. You know, you, you had Jesus. You had all of them. It's like there are no more. And you're going to get reminders. And guess what? The reminders are going to be bad reminders. Hmm. So yeah. whatever happened in 2016, here's your reminder what should happen in 2016. And it's like, you know, wow. I, I literally think in a year. Yeah. I think in a year, man, uh, the United States is going to look like uh, pre-Islamic Saudi Arabia. Oh, gosh. And we're just going to have uh, butt-naked people making hawa <laughs> from uh, the White House. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you're only partly joking, but I mean, yeah. in in you know, man, I, I'm li- I'm thinking of uh, I'm thinking of starting a school for idol making. <laughs> that's because that's where we are now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's you know the whole the whole thing is right because I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm like the whole the whole narrative is don't normalize it, don't normalize yeah, it, yeah. don't normalize it, and I'm like you know what, fair enough. Yeah. I I agree with that. Right. But here's the problem. There's a whole generation of kids that's going to grow up with this as normal. Well, that's I think that's it. Uh, his is long form. I have a bit in this presentation called Trump and E flat, mm-hmm. and I have a jazz band playing behind me in E flat. My understanding that Trump comes from being a teacher. I taught severely most disturbed kids for eleven years. Okay. So we understand behavior, behavior modification. They don't really want us to teach. Mm-hmm. They want us to modify behavior. My first year teaching in Milwaukee, tough year, tough rookie year. But it was highlighted by this one kid. Every day this kid would get up at 2 o'clock and, and, he, and, and he pee on the floor. 2 o'clock, pee on the floor. Mm-hmm. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, clockwork. Clockwork. Pee on the floor. The first week... Everybody's in, you know, outrage. Like, what are you doing? Oh, my God, what are you doing? You know, second week, does the same thing. Attitude change. Well, what's wrong? Do you need a hug? Do you need to talk to somebody? Tell them about your feelings. The third week, kid gets on the floor. All the kids in the room look at each other and go, hey, man, it's 2 o'clock. Wow. Well, there we go. So with Donald Trump, it's, it's, always, two, yeah. it's always 2 o'clock. Yeah. But no, you you know whether what? Whether he pees on you know what's funny. It's two o'clock. You know what's funny is is the corollary there is I'm at a point now where I roll out of bed and I go to Twitter. What crazy thing did he say? It's not, geez, Louise, why is it right? It's oh, okay. Let's see what he said. And and literally, I've 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 had to shut off. I need. I'm on it's like news. Always detox. two o'clock. Yeah. You know, we got this kid yeah. to stop peeing on the floor. But that's we, a fascinating. We had to change it. We we used to manipulate the clock in the classroom. Not funny. Really? And he, he manipulated still, it, and yeah. he couldn't figure out when 2 o'clock ah, was. Ah, yeah, yeah. And then the killer part was, I had a, te- I had I a mentor teacher. I yeah. I had a mentor teacher, and she goes, what's going on? And I'm telling her, she goes, oh, is that what you're doing? I go, yeah. She goes, uh, well, you know, sometimes it's 2 o'clock in his house. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went over to his kid's house on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Oh, 150, 155, knocked on the door. What are you doing here? You know, he talked to your mother. Yeah. And I called ahead and she was like, What's going on? I said, Let's, let's, I'm looking at my watch. Yeah. Two o'clock comes. He doesn't pee on the floor. He does not? I said, Ma'am. Yeah. Here's what we've been doing. Last three weeks, this kid, two o'clock, pees on the floor. I said, I came here to see if he's going to pee on your floor. And the mother was like, Oh, we're going to get this right right now. Go get that belt. Huh. But what happens is people in their minds think they can get away with a situation because you're going to normalize the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. His mother had no idea. His mother represents a whole other level of logic. He was a normal kid over here. Mm-hmm. But over here, I can act out. Over here, I can... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I... Yeah, because it, to your point also, Zaki, about waking up every morning and, and it just it's just a continuation of the craziness... I think that the way in which that continues to happen day in and day out is in and of itself a way that Trump has been able to normalize this. Mm-hmm. Is because regardless of how we respond to it, another word that was being thrown around last few days has been civility, right? How do you how do you 
you know, is, is was it proper what the Red Hen restaurant did yeah. to Sarah Huckabee Sanders? The the point and, and whether it was civil or not and what they did. But the point is normalizing is happening just by the sheer volume of craziness that's coming out from this administration. But look at And that's why I mean sorry, going back to really quick, Zucky, about the point we were what I what I asked you earlier about why is this moment in history more troubling than you know, the day after the election is because you you've seen what this administration is capable of. The mm-hmm. like the 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 extreme uh, nature of this administration, and now you have, like you said, you you have a realization that the levers of democ- American democracy are not enough to impede this administration's crazy vision of the world. Yeah. And that's what makes this scary, mm-hmm. right? Because you have an extreme agenda. You have an extreme administration with an extreme agenda. You have a and rubber. You have a, you, you have a rubber stamp. You know, legislative body. Well, which hopefully can change somewhat in the upcoming midterms. And now you have a Supreme Court where a five-four. You know, uh, not to call that a balance, but a five-four. What would you call that? A majority. five-four. Huh? Majority. No, no, majority, but a 5-4 relationship on the board, I mean, on, on, on the court, can be now significantly altered to be, you know, 6-3. Yeah. Now, the only hope in all of this is that you get like a Sandra o- uh, Day O'Connor situation where, where she was a Reagan appointee yeah. who ended up being a liberal. Or, a, I'm sorry, a moderate. And let's let's... Assume that that won't be the case, right. right? It, you know, the thought I had, I was thinking about this, and it's all like, after, you know, hindsight. But okay. it's like, look at look at the miscalculation that the Democrats made, and I put this on President Obama to be honest. He's like, here's Merrick Garland, the most inoffensive, <laughs> middle of the road white guy. Right. Here, Republican milk toast, and you know, yeah. and this is not in any way denigrating Merrick Garland. I'm sure he would have yeah. been a great justice. Right. That's not the point I'm making. Yeah. But. But even that, you see what I'm saying? Even that was not enough. Whereas, what if he said, here's a woman of color. Here's the first Mm. black female justice Mm. of the Supreme Court. Make it somebody worth fighting for. Do you see? Like, my point is, if they're going to give you zero Mm. anyway, then you make it somebody who they have to really defend being horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? That's a great point. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I I was thinking about about this on the drive. It's like like Obama tried to play safe and placate. And they still. I mean, this is what President Obama did, right? Were, and were recalcitrant. Like, but I, I think I think the thing is. No, no, you're right. I think pre- President Obama did that. I, th- I think the thing is, man. For eight years. We, 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 we the Democrats, in some regards, uh, and we, we, we have that in our community. Hmm. We have people who. Uh, you mean cowards? <laughs> That too. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, um, yeah. you, you know what it is, man? And people overindulge, and uh, they're, they're, they're caught up in the discourse. Yeah. Um, they're caught up in the discourse to the point that it it, it, it affects action. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a story when I was a kid. A kid, a, bu- a guy was a bully. Yeah, he's a bully. Came around, and uh, you know he he, bu- he punk everybody. I want to take your lunch and da da da. And there was one kid that said, "You know what? Because you're not gonna take my lunch anymore." And everybody was like, "What? What? You're not gonna take my lunch, anymore. The guy said, I'll take your lunch. You're not gonna take it." Anymore. And you know what? When they went to tussle, the guy was no bigger than me. The bully was huge. Mm. But all the guys my size, we jumped on the bully. Mm. Because you know what? You have to have a credible threat. Hmm. And the Democrats did not have a credible threat for an amount of years. And it was like, look, we don't take you seriously. That's yeah. right. You know, the scope right. of it is, yeah. you know, um, I don't know if you ever remember the movie uh, Raising in the Sun, Sidney Poitier. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I always got mad at Sidney Poitier because uh, at the end, these white people paid him all his money not to move in the neighborhood. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, yo, I'd have taken that money. And I'd have moved in the neighborhood anyway. Right. <laughs> right. I'm like, because I want you to know that's the type of black man that you're dealing with. Right, mm-hmm. right. So, I'm like, if the if, 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 if the uh, position was switched, you would have done it. And I'm like, listen, there, there there's things where people are very good about talking 
you know, because they're hoping it's not going to escalate to anything. Huh. What the Republicans do is they're very good about we're going to hype, we're going to hype, and hype. These politicians are not doing it. You're having people come out of the, the woodwork who average people to manifest this ugliness. Yeah. You know, now I feel like I'm empowered to go talk to Parvez a certain way because I have this this. I've been overdosing on American exceptionalism or white supremacy exceptionalism sure. and I have the right to say this is hey, you know, one time I was a kid and, and I did the busing years you know in the words of one busing I, I didn't take the bus I had to walk to school with all these white kids and watch the black kids come on the bus so I was in between mm. and I remember this kid man every day he used to call me the n-word you nigga you nigga you nigga and I really wanted to... I beat him up. He still didn't want it. We got in a crowd one day, and he said, this is my beginning of my comedy career. He goes, you're a nigga. And I said, spell it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he put a J in there. I was like, game over. <laughs> N-I-G-J. I was like, and everybody just fell out laughing. And I was like, yeah. I said, like, because you can never use that word again because yeah. you misspelled it right now. Huh. And I got total recall on this situation. Not only I do, that person has that person. Has that. And it's like, we're not afraid to... We, we're, we're, in some regards, I feel like we're not afraid to go there. All that made me funny for all the years that we were out, we never had people come after us. Because huh. comedians are dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, I got something for that. Yeah. Uh, you really want to come over here? Because you're going to come over here with a set of rules that work over there. Well, there's no rules over here. Only rule is, I just need to be funnier than you. I'll take from whatever you give me and I'm going to turn it around. I'm like, that was the scope. Mm. And so we, we've kind of lost that. We, For some point or some reason, it's like we don't want to engage that way. Mm. We don't want to get dirty. Well, we see it. And, you know, we were talking about this whole civility conversation, you know, and. And I, I had an exchange with somebody on Twitter yesterday where I said, look, uh, first of all, how are we defining civility and who's defining it, right? Because the people who are being protested don't get to say, no, you can't protest me this way, right? And when you look at what happened with Sarah Sanders, the owner of the restaurant went up to her and said, would you mind leaving, please? We'd like to not serve you. To me, that's the most civil way because the uncivil way is hey, we did some stuff to your food that you just ate. Right, and the by the way, but you pay us now. Brought to the owner's attention by I think the waiting staff. The waiting staff. Yeah, they and called the, yeah. the owner, yeah. and then the owner in turn said, "I want to hear from you guys." Yeah, she didn't want to speak. She, you know, it was a, a kind of a democrat. It was as democratic of a process as you can get. Yeah. she consulted with the waiting staff and you know, and, and just everyone at the restaurant who worked there, and they all felt, and I think there were people, certainly minorities, others in the way, in, you know, in the staff who said, yeah, they didn't want to serve her. And so then Sarah Sanders was given the bad news and the, she got, she got comp the, 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 the cheese dish that she had ordered. Yeah. So she I shouldn't mean, be eating cheese. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, mean yeah. I think this I goes to this broader conversation. Right? I agree. Like, like, it's like a politician, like we're seeing it right now, right? Where, where the president is going after the late night hosts. Mm-hmm. Right? And why is he going after them? Because they go after him, right? But th- that's not how comedy works. Comedy is about punching up, right? That's the whole. That's the. That's how. I mean, you know better than me, right? That's here's a, here's a, here's, a, here's, a, here's the thing. None of this, and I'm gonna make a prediction. None of this is going to stop until Trump goes after the wrong black man. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And this is the dude who's going to go, you know what? That's a... It, I'm not playing. Yeah. Like, I'll take your whole crew out. I'm not that dude. Yeah, yeah. Like, for me, I'm not that dude. If you come after me, they say, look, you've, been, you've, been, you've, you've, you've set up a scenario whereby this is how we get it. So then, I mean, if I could... If I, could not, I don't want to translate that, but if I could make... Yeah, I guess, well, if I translate that, that means that... Trump can violate a lot of standing norms. Sure. But what he cannot do, as what you're arguing, is is insult or uh, offend uh, in a in a real way the African American community and get away with it. You're not gonna. You're not. This is what is he's what doing. This is what he's doing now. He's obviously violated so many norms and gotten away with it. Right. And even gotten yeah. elected. And, and well, here's the thing. Yeah. The African American community and and. and 
to some extent, the Latino community, you're not going to get that dignity. Hmm. You're never going to get the dignity. And when you get to that level, yeah, whole game changes. Hip-hop changes. Okay? Jazz musician changes. Athletes change. You know, in a position where you are, in essence, pop culture, the coolest trick I can ever do is I'm going to leave you alone, but I'm going to get your kids. Mm. Right. I'm going to change it. I'll cause this, this unity in your family because your kids are going to be like, oh, oh, wait a minute, daddy. We, I'm not down with that. Huh. I'm going to, I'm going to de- delegitimize you in that way. Yeah. And the scope is there is a, there's a reckoning coming mm. because, you know, the civil rights piece is, is not working. This is like a, resi- this is like a revisiting of civil rights history. Yeah. At a certain yeah, point, yeah. civil rights worked, but then it didn't work and you had to have SNCC. Then you had to have yeah, Panthers. Right, right, and so, a Black Lives Matter is scary. You know, because they had to come out with a whole uh, yeah. black identity extremism yeah. hmm. to, we're going to try and marshal anything in terms of black political protest right. or expression. Right. And that was the whole thing with Kaepernick. You know. Right. See, well, yeah, and I, I, I don't want to digress, but see, they went after Kaepernick that first year when he was playing. Yeah. And they couldn't really get him because the the sample small was the sample size was too small. You know, you go after one guy, it's just one guy. Mm-hmm. A year later, you know, he has, gives his speech down in Alabama, and they have all these black men. He, and he can turn around to some of his people and go, "See, I told you." Hmm. Now you have a situation where everybody's real quiet. So you're sitting back and you're looking. Dave Chappelle had a brilliant analogy talking about heroin use. In the white community, how it's an epidemic. And I was, you know, when heroin, when heroin use is an epidemic in the white community, and they need help, they need services. That's right. But back in the crack years, it was like locked all them, like all them brothers up. Yeah. Okay. And he said something funny, sarcastic, brilliant. This guy goes, "Yeah," I says. He goes, "I know how you white people feel now with the heroin epidemic, because I grew up in Washington D.C. during the crack epidemic, and I feel like you do." He goes, uh, "I don't care." <laughs> Right. I don't care. It's <laughs> it's so there's a there's a space now. Yeah. And there's a growing theme. I like it. Theme where a lot of us that say us, a lot of them, uh, a lot of us are like, you know what? We we don't we don't care. And it's like, you know, we're real we're real introspective about this thing because I'm like that 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 hustle is weak and that game is good. You can do certain things with certain people, you know, mm-hmm. in the neighborhood, there's always a guy who acts like he's bully and da da da. But we all know he's soft. He's soft as butter in July. Mm. Mm. They call it pulling your card. And I feel like Trump is getting ready to get his nice. card pulled. Card pulled. I think. I think. Sally wow. Mueller. I think Mueller's gonna pull cards. Because mm. now, once you, you you discredit it in some regards, mm. or you look to be, um, you lose power. Not so much credibility, but you lose power. It's it's a bit, it's it's a it's a nuanced type of thing. You lose the ability to always threaten with uh, playing the trump card, pun intended, I guess. Sure. <laughs> um, so so I, I want to I, I I I think the heightened urgency of the moment kind of had us Zucky, um, you know, kind of break format when we have these when we have these long format yeah. degrees. If there is a format, I know, but we've come to kind of. You know, there, there has been somewhat of a format to the show, and and I don't sure. want to, I don't want to, I don't want, I'd be remiss if we didn't at least touch on sure. your background a little bit, and, sure. and, and kind of bring everyone up to speed about your background, and then I'd love for you, since we do have you on the show, and I know the clock is ticking, have take, you take have you talk about um, have you talk about? Oh, I want to get your thoughts on comedy in general. Um, the, the good thing is you, we're in a safe space here in the in, in the sense that. We like to pride ourselves in long form interviews, so you're right. I mm-hmm. mean, we're not we're not stuck to the clock. Although there's probably a certain limit beyond which even we we, we do tend to probably lose our listeners. <laughs> but, but that's the, okay. So so take us back. Um, I know a little bit about your background story because you and I spent some time in Washington D.C. Yes, last month, which was wonderful. But um, I, for the sake of our audience and, and Zucky, um, tell us a little bit about you and your origin story, your background. Um. Wow, man, my mother uh, was 
was an early civil rights contributor. Um, front lines, Danville, Virginia, uh, when King was really trying to start out back in the day. Father, Virginia um, is that Southern Virginia or is that by the right DC on the uh, right on the uh, North Carolina line? Oh wow, so sa- like, that's the, uh, that's the like, South, like Yanceyville, yeah, Danville is like eleven miles, Roxboro, mm-hmm. for anybody that's from the uh, huh. uh, Virginia North Carolina area. So my mother um, saw that yeah. um, the, the 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 legal legally enforced black servitude. Is what she called it. Wow. Uh, she wound up going to Howard University. Her and my aunt, uh, my aunt went to Howard Law. Uh, my mother later got her law degree from Catholic University. But um, my evolution was: I woke up every day going, "Why do I have to feel equal to that?" Hmm. Huh. Like literally, I was like, "I'm better than that." Mm-hmm. I always felt like King got assassinated when he basically they were like, "You wanted to be black equal to white people," and he goes, "Well, who the hell want to be equal to to that?" Hmm. And then he was vastly expendable, um, and I felt like, "Why? Why do we have to work up to models that don't work? Wow. Why do I want to equate myself to a model that doesn't work? Why don't I just develop my own?" model for what I'm doing. I mean, Franz Fanon and the Wretched of the Earth talked about the whole idea of false ego ideal, which is colonized people mm-hmm. are so colonized that when they're given freedom, they just, they, they just go back, they just inspire to be the people that oppress them. I'm like, I, don't, yeah. I don't want to do that. And I was like, you know what? We have to get out of that space. So comedy for me becomes this working lab of logic and religion later on, but logic you know, I, I had a teacher who, uh, uh, Miss Alveda Jones, sixth grade teacher. Uh, in the sixth grade, I thought she was the meanest black woman that God had ever put on the earth. <laughs> um, oh, I love this story. Sorry. <laughs> and she walks in, and I don't realize her background. You know, she was from the old teachers, old black Negro teachers college, and education <laughs> is how you go. Yeah. And here I am telling jokes about this lady, and, yeah. you know, and, 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 she walks in her first day of school. Everyone had to stand up. I'm like, we haven't had to do this for the whole of elementary. Why are we standing up? And this lady goes, my name is Miss Alveda Jones. She goes, I'm not here to be your buddy, your friend. I'm here to get you ready for life. Sit down and shut up. And mm-hmm. I'm like, this is not going to be fun at all. Mm-hmm. But what you miss is the nuance of a lady who's understood the importance of education, how you get to a point. And she's trying to put it in us kids because... To her, our success is life and death. Hmm. Clearly, life and death. So, you know, and I remember getting caught up. I, I used to tell jokes in class. I won't, I won't tell the joke now, right. but right. I got caught telling a joke, and it was a blue joke. It was a red fox joke. And uh, she, at the end of it, she goes, uh, she goes, Mr. Moss, do you know the? She goes, um, you know the difference between a, being a comedian and a clown? I said, no, ma'am. She goes. Until you do get your education. Wow. Nice. Yeah. And you were how old? Sixth grade, like, I think okay. 11. Sure. But that thing... This is in Washington, D.C., This is right? Washington, D.C., yeah. so you're... You see, you see how it, 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 it frames things for you. Yeah. And so, literally, growing up, you're, you're looking at these particular lenses. Like, kids would listen to, you know, uh, they would listen to hip-hop music back then. I was listening to the Last Poets. You know, I was in the last poets. You know, uh, the white man has God complex. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, d- 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 because you're seeing life come at you, and it was it was just interesting. So then it talk just, about life coming at you though, because I know. So you know, when you told when I heard you tell that story, we were we were there at El Hibri, and we were at, right there on Embassy Row. You said you grew, you you grew up mostly down the street from there. Yeah. Tell us about the dynamic. I, I know because I know racial tensions. In addition, play a major factor in growing up in Washington D.C. Yeah. In addition to it being the nation's capital, but kind of talk about what makes D.C. so unique. Well, D.C. essentially was because you grew up in D.C. Correct. Yeah. Your mom you, you my dad was a, my dad was born in D.C. Okay. I was born in D.C. And your mom now is a lawyer uh, in, in Washington D.C. Well, well, she she's not time. she's retired. No, no, but I mean well, at that time she, at that that time, time, she worked yeah. government job. Got, my father. Got Worked at NIH. He was a 
So they had really good jobs, yeah. but they had these ghosts behind them. And that ghost is growing up in Washington, D.C. A lot of people don't realize it, yeah. that Washington, D.C., essentially, was a southern town. Hmm. Okay. And In the uh, sense that? In the sense that you had a lot of black people come from down south of the D.C., but it's also a southern town in the sense that, that there was a, um, a controlling board that was all white. All white, ah. That was all white. And they used to bring the police up from West Virginia. They hired a bunch of guys from West Virginia to be the police force, which was the oppressing force. And people don't realize, you know, D.C. didn't have a black mayor until way later. You know, before you got Mayor and Barry and all of that, I'm like, you're, you're looking at the fact that these people lived on these. So my father talks about what it is to get up and have to live with that every day, every day. And so... so you're, and and you're, so you're dealing with a power structure, whether it's... Or, or authority. And I'm, and I'm right that's on That's not, not... Not only you, I mean the black community uh, that, as happens a lot in... Not only in the South, but arguably in major cities across mm-hmm. the country that are not representative of them. Right? Yeah. Or, it's not representative of your community. Of, of, of the, of of the, the, the community. community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, I, I laugh, you know... This is how old I am. I had to years ago. I had to go to Canada, and this is before you had to have a passport, and yeah. you could have your birth certificate. That's all you needed. And I gave it to the per, to the person, and uh, under race, uh, it, it said colored. And the poor Canadian person was like, "Well, what color? <laughs> what what color do you want to be?" <laughs> Fascinating. Didn't say Negro. Didn't say black. It right. said colored. Because mm. more than sixty six. Okay. And he's like, yo, I'm I'm that, that dude. Yeah. Look, I'm that dude. I'm that last, we're that last line of guys mm-hmm. that came out of that scope. Yeah. So it's like, yo, this, this, you're, you're the, uh, you're carrying, you're the, you're the torch bearers in some regards. Right. And so comedy was logic. So most of the time I'm on stage, things I say are not necessarily funny to me. People just watching me work out the logic on stage. Mm. Like a lot of times, things are just very, 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 very confusing to me. Like Christianity was very, very confusing to me at some point because yeah. I felt like I got to talk to you to talk to God. I got to talk to you two dudes so you talk to God for me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I'm like, first of all, uh, first of all, you're an alcoholic. Second of all, you cheated on your wife. I don't know how I got to talk to you in the first place. Huh. I can handle it myself, but you know, it's that, mm-hmm. it's that, it's that whole thing. So is that what drives you, or compels you to search for an alternative to whatever religious affiliation you grew up in? I think we all have a we all have a, a revelation about religion. Yeah. The functionality of religion, especially like that moment of epiphany, right? It's also, it's also the absence of having like a, a black theological institution. Like there's no there's no black seminaries, you know, for for. But I mean, the black church is the black is, church is, is, is an but yeah, entity in and of itself. It's an entity, but it's not. There's no school for it. Okay. There's no school for it. So. So oh, you're saying so if you were religiously inclined, you couldn't find a black institution to study at. Yeah, because black institutions, yeah. for the most part, are based on or oh, religious institutions. Yeah. Just, well, in its things, you know, black religious thought. Yeah. Up, up until a certain point is what white people gave you. Yeah, mm, yeah. Well, certainly within Christianity. Yeah, it's what white people gave you. And then you have, after the Civil War, you have the introduction of Oriental religions. And people going, wait a minute, I can do my own due diligence. Let me look at history. I mean, if you look at the uh, uh, the Morris Science Temple, you know what they talked about? They talked about not being um, labeled as black. Some of them talking about their, their, their heritage to... Native Americans, which was valid then, but the heritage of Native Americans also, we have a right to land. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and with this, this type of thought is, you know, of course, smushed out, but I mean, you have the Ahmadiyya movement, which yeah. is, you know, which is not talked about a lot, but you have blacks and Indians. Well, it was growing and it was, it was vibrant growing. in the black community. And then you have Nation of Islam, Prior and it's like, you know, and the Nation of Islam directly addresses the things that are going on right then and right there. And that was the scope. And so I literally say I'm, I'm a Sunni Muslim, but I have uh, Nation of Islam uh, tendencies. So when you, so you embrace Islam. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 
approximately are we talking about the 70s 80s what are we talking about late uh, late 80s late 80s you take your shot now do you are you do you you don't come in. Do you come into Sunni Islam by way of the nation, or are you, did you just say that in kind of tongue in cheek in terms of no, what you just said about I, I would say, identifying yourself now as a Sunni Muslim? I think I was more nation. Um, I was very much more nation. I never joined a nation. Okay. Um, but I had an affinity towards the nation. Okay. As a young black man, if you start looking at the time frame, you're talking about yeah. crack wars and things like that. And so there's an abandonment of uh, black male identity. Yeah. In terms of a pure understanding, because everything then, I mean, you used to turn on the TV. I remember uh, one of the articles was uh, you know, the black male. I'll cut this up. The black male is listed as an endangered species, which is like inherently uh, crazy. Like, you know, we could be extinct. Hmm. I used to make a joke like, you know, give us five years, we're going to be on, you know, wildlife preserve. Here's the, uh, here's, here's, the white, no, no, here's, here's the white rhinoceros and the black man that wanted to go to school and be a doctor. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. I had dreams. <laughs> I could have been somebody. Right. Um, but yeah, while, you, you know, while, while I laugh, I'm like, that was a real thing. And the scope that every day you got up, particularly those times, like, this could be it. Hmm. Sure. The acceptance is a great analogy for black men during the crack wars. Uh, death was two o'clock. Hmm. Every day was two o'clock. You didn't have to be good. You didn't have to be bad. You'd be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's all it took. It was two o'clock. <clears throat> wow. Right. And so we, I mean, you heard what so happened to so and so? Yeah, man, it's just, mm. it's messed up. You didn't have any space for outrage. So then, is your introduction into the community uh, by way of Imam Warthadi and Muhammad? Yes. Okay. I originally had planned to join the nation. Yeah. Uh, but he uh, never became an official, or like a member. Or you know what person. happened? Yeah. Quick story is uh, the brother who was in in the nation telling me, "Go here, go here, go here." He essentially, man, he sends me to the wrong masjid. Oh wow! And I realized he had been locked up for a minute, so he didn't know that the Muhammad hey. Muhammad's mosque number four is now. Master Mas- Muhammad. Right. Yeah, you go down there on Fourth Street, they'll take care of you. And I went there oh, and I'm man. like, hey, I'm looking for bow tie. Yeah. <laughs> I went on Friday and nobody had, I was like, maybe it's casual Friday, you know? <laughs> and uh you you get there and That's... and I tell the brother, you know, and he says, Mm-mm. We're gonna take care of you. Nice. Mm. That's got little law, man. That's, he that, said, that's he says, We're gonna take right care of you. He goes, yeah. We understand where you're coming from. Uh-huh. He said, but there's an evolution. Beautiful. And he said, so even he said, even if you want to be in a nation, here's some things that you need to know. Nice. Wow. And I was like, that. That's it. I mean, I still have really good relationships with Nation of Islam brothers, yeah. and and some of the things that they're doing uh, in terms of their Akita, I, I support them. You know, like cause a lot of people think, oh, they're on this. Uh, you you can actually go. Uh, you can go to a kuppah on Friday and a brother will give a legitimate kuppah. And you know, they're trying to, you know, they've always been trying to evolve. Mm-hmm. It's like you just have to be aware of those things. But, right. But in terms of comedy, yeah. it, it became it became protest comedy. Protest comedy. Yeah. Now you're almost, and you've, because I've also heard you say this story, you're almost tasked with going into comedy. In spi- I mean, obviously you had an interest in it. You talk about you know, Red Fox jokes, telling the Red, Red Fox jokes back in the sixth grade, um, by Imam Warthin himself. Yeah. Personally. Like, so you had that kind of act, act, and like looking, relationship. And, and looking him. back, Red Fox was an activist. And well, looking, let's yeah. talk about comedy. Uh, I want to, I want to come back to that, but let's finish your story and then we'll come back oh, to no, the history no. of sort of protest comedy and what that means and the relationship to comedy and protest. Well, I think I that mean, is the a idea, really critical the idea of discussion. All that made me funny yeah. comes up, and I waited two years after nine eleven. I waited two years because I wanted to see how the community was going to respond. You know, is it as we allude to earlier? Is it going to be uh, house Muslims, yeah. field Muslims, you know, field Muslim situation, or are we really going to rise up and come up with this organic model to deal with these things? And I waited two years, and I decided, well, I'm going to do. Stand up for our people. 
Hmm. See, because I became Muslim to keep my soul out of hell. I became a Muslim comedian because our people were catching hell. But had you already been doing comedy before? I've been working on all, all kind of audiences, but I made a really fundamental shift to... I'm going to... I would like to, inshallah, establish something organic and our hmm. thing. So our comedy... You remember the beginning? Our comedy was clean. It was family-oriented. You know, there were certain things you just weren't saying. Hmm. You know, there was... There was, there was uh, you know, there, there was there was proper reverence to Allah. There's proper reverence to you know family life, social life, community life. You know, the idea of prophethood. All these things were important. You know, these things were important. And I'm like, you can still speak the truth and still have those things as positive filters. A lot of guys think, oh, if I do that, then I can't. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I can't be real. No, you're being real here. Yeah. You know, but I can't. It's, it's real and it's relevant. So, so, hmm. so you know, but what history of, I mean, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm curious as to when that, when that period ever changed. Like, what has changed, like, within Muslim comedy? I mean, it, to be, and before we answer yeah. that, I mean, it feels like there's still a relative paucity in terms of Muslim comedians, in terms of the imprint uh, right, I mean, because there, at, there's at least uh, I mean, maybe I'm just not maybe we're no, no. I, I, I put me and you in the same category, right? But like, I mean, unless we're just not in the know. Because I remember when Uzzer was first starting out, yeah. and I, I remember when when I first heard of you again, it was the early aughts, yeah. and and I feel like that pool has not grown substantially. Mm-mm, it's diminished. Well, why is that? In your opinion, I mean, obviously, it's just yeah, well, you say it's diminished. Yeah, man. Wow. So. I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it as I see it. Okay. No, no, yeah. But so, so then maybe give us a little brief. Like, what is the history of the, of Muslim comedy? And you don't the have to be shy. You, you I'm, can, not, I'm not going to be. Yeah. The history of Muslim comedy is that if you go back and you look at the old things that were written, written on the websites, from Allah made me funny, they've been taken down, but I, I still have the original. Yeah, yeah. The idea is that number one, we wanted to have a situation where Muslims came out and they could self-validate themselves. Don't wait for other people. Self-validate yourself. See yourself as a full entity okay. in the world. So, so we didn't do it in Master. We did it in a comedy club. So is that the genesis of Muslim comedy? Allah made me funny. And if it is, who who are those people? Because I, I, all, all I know from I'm that the, list I'm, is you and Azu. I'm the Azu. Fi- I'm the founder of Allah made me funny. Okay. And you would, and, and, and I went, again, without I being went, shy, you would I say that that's... Found, I went and found Azu. Right. I, I but that's the him. genesis. That's the starting point. And then point. we also had Azim Muhammad. So yeah. you had three guys that uh-huh. represented largely history of those African American Muslim okay. Sunni. Azim was in the nation. Oh. And Azar from yeah. from the immigrant population. Now, what we did was we're very, very strategic. We said, listen, we know what the hustle is. So when all of made me funny gets going on, maybe I just really like it, da 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 da. Yeah. People are going to choose sides. We want him. That's our guy. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm. Now, internally, it's like, what we have to understand is that's going to happen. We have to make sure that that doesn't break off. Yeah. And so for Azar, the thing was, we're going to teach you how to be a comedian. Because remember, he's a lawyer. Yeah. We're going to teach you the basis of how to be a comedian. Because it's even our road comments. Already. We were road comics. We were established yeah. road comics. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, we're going to teach you the game. Okay. Which is not just that, it's sustainability. And so we took him around to comedy spaces. He probably wouldn't have gotten into the improv for five, six, seven, eight years if I didn't have those relationships. Right. So he saw a lot of things, but he saw a lot of black people. And they supported. They were like, listen, we're going to be here. We're here at the beginning. Remember one thing Muhammad said something very important. I don't want to I don't want to lose this point. When the idea came about doing all that made me funny, you wanted some you wanted some approval. He says, You 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 have my he said, he basically says you, you have my support. Right. With one caveat. Mm-hmm. He says, Don't start it in the African American community. Oh, that's interesting. Always being a visionary. <laughs> he said, Go start it over there. And I said, Amen. That's like starting over. I was like, I'm 
I'm doing it. I'm coming. That's like starting over. And he looks at me and he says, well, are you funny or not? Wow. Which is like Miss Jones going, are you a comedian or are you a client? Right, yeah. right. What's the difference? What are you going to be? Because he, you know. Why did he say that? Did he understand the power structure within the Muslim community? Yeah. He said, we have scholars. I mean, we, have I Islamic, to, yeah. we have Islamic scholars over here that can't get, they can't get on the minbar anywhere. That's right. He said they can't, they can't speak to those people that are, you know, he was, he, they're keeping it real. Yeah. He said, well, with that comedy thing, he said, that's new. It's because comedy reached the kids, mm-hmm. reached the teenagers. You know, so if you had my uncle, 80 years old, I don't like him. Uh, you, you're 80 right now. I don't know how long you're going to be around, but. Let me deal with these people yeah. who are still out in the world, or still out in the world, and things like that. You know, you think about it, it made me funny, man. We carried a whole generation. We started in 2004, 2014. We were still touring. We carried a whole generation. Mm-hmm. So you say that the pool has diminished. Uh, the thought is, the thought is, listen. When I started, my mentor said, listen, you know, Reginald Kitchen, pray for him. He needs a kidney. But when we were teaching, and uh, I worked as a teacher, worked as an outreach worker, he said, man, we in the business of saving lives, which is really what he meant, what Dean Muhammad used to say. He said, man, we in the business of saving lives. We're trying to keep souls out of hell. And that was the mandate. It was a community mandate. Now most comedians these days, it's, uh, it's not about the people. Hmm. It's not about the people. I'll use the people so these people think that I have a base or following so I can get a TV show, I can get on here. That's what that is. So then... You have some Muslim comedians, the they, won't even, it, they won't even return a salam. Really? Yeah. And maybe yeah. the reason we don't get it, Zucky, is because of the way we're defining Muslim comedy versus the way Preacher is. It's evolved now. Right? In fairness, I mean, I, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but it's evolved a certain way. Could it's, you define? Because you're almost you're arguing that Muslim comedy, by definition, Muslim, has a Muslim, message. You're saying a Muslim comedian is not the same as a comedian who happens to be Muslim. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think the game is. I think the game. I mean, let's is be real. real. Then would you? Then by that token, would you define Dave Chappelle? Where does he? Where does he fit in that demarcation that Zucky just pointed out? He's a comedian who happens to be a Muslim, or is he Muslim comedy? I think he's both. I think I think you'll find he's yeah. he's both. I think Dave Chappelle reminds me when I was younger that you would go out on stage and you would put ideas out, uh-huh. and people go, "Oh, that's interesting," huh. you know, because there was something to the ideas. Yeah. No, I'm gonna play you know devil's advocate, yes. or um, as my as my beloved brother Osama likes to say, angel's advocate, right? And, and that is that some would argue that Dave Chappelle by virtue of the language he uses on stage, mm-hmm. by virtue of the fact that he may not, you know, be as practicing as some others. Sure. And some of his, and a lot of his material being sexually explicit, etc. Yeah, I saw it. It doesn't fit the definition of a Muslim comedian, but a comedian who happens to be Muslim. Uh, that, what would you say to that? Well, I mean, he, he said something in an interview yeah. years ago. Now, because I'd be curious, what I, I never asked this question to us her. I think but I want to ask this question to you. I think the thing about Dave is it's genuine. Hmm. It's authentic. Authentic. And I feel like some Muslim comedians take his authenticity as license to do it themselves. If he did it, then it's right. all right for me to do it. Because he... But you haven't been through... Yeah. See, he's a, he's a kid, 14, right. 14 years old at the Comedy Cafe... And watching him to see his mother has to take him on stage. Yeah. He's a guy that goes, you know what? I know what I want to do. Yeah. I'm not a comedian. I want to go to New York. And he's 17 years old. He's that guy. That's yeah. right. These guys are, are not the that, that guy. They, they would just be faking the funk. They, yeah. They're faking the funk. And it's like, they want to be... God bless them. I love them. Yeah, yeah. They want to be seen in that way, but you haven't put in That's right. that work. You don't know what he went through. You don't know what his family went through. You know, you don't know that that struggle. Yeah. Because that type of struggle, it takes most people out. You don't know it. I mean, this is a, I mean, 
heart wrenching stories, but so well, the, and the idea that oh, uh, profanity is the reason Dave Chappelle is popular. That would be a very reductive and ridiculous reading of why he's. I feel like sometimes profanity makes it a little less. It makes it a, a, a little lighter hmm. than what he's actually yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have to hire a band to. <laughs> I got to hire a jazz band because I'm like some people are like we, we we never saw this coming from preach. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> because I have to give you the rhythm of how I'm seeing it. I see things in music. Nice. And I'm like I have to do this because I need to help you understand what I'm saying. Dave Chappelle, you know, isn't Dave Chappelle myself maybe other people you know what we are we're failed jazz musicians <laughs> no I mean I'm serious you know I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go on the record here and, and I normally don't do something like this but I'm gonna say that I agree with you and and and, and my assessment of art in general is that art is art is its own thing man it's going to be organic it's going to be uh, authentic it, it, you know to be real meaningful art and in that authenticity, in that realness, people are going to uh, bring their th- themselves into the mix, and that includes people's backgrounds that may be comfortable using a profanity, or maybe even consuming uh, uh, marijuana, or Look, skirting maybe. around no skirting around uh, issues of, of Muslim orthodoxy or orthopraxy. But to me, all of that is still within the broad lens of Muslim art because it, I don't know. I, maybe I'm not being clear here, but I, I, I look at it. I think art. I think artistic expression. You can't. It's like the genie's out of the bottle. You can't. You can't contain it because then, if you try to license it and contain it and try to censor it, then it it, it no longer. Is authentic and but real. You bring, but you can point. You bring a point. Yeah. Now you bring up a very valid point, which is when it's authentic, it, it means something. When it's copied, yeah. Uh, replicated, mm. it's not authentic, right. and it presents a presumptive danger to the consumer. Wow. Because kids think that's the way yeah. we get down. Right, right. Nice. I like that. So, oh, he did it. I did it. Right. Look, man, I look at I, 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 I listen to music now. Yeah. I, I, I try to listen to some stuff the kids are listening to. Yeah. Well, I was about to say. I mean, that's like if you look at uh, the progression of hip hop music, right? If you look at like somebody know. one day somebody said, you know what, Public Enemy is too real. Yeah. Give us N.W.A. Right. N.W.A. is way too real right let's give us yeah. give us this yeah but that's way too real you know what let's just have either we can't understand the words right or the words are going to be in such a staccato fashion it's not even communication yeah. you turn on the radio you go higga 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 that's a song. That's a hit song, man. So good. I mean, no, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean I mean, I'm like, what? Because you're whoa, trying whoa. to create well, it in I mean, a laboratory, that's, that's or in this point, case, right? a I mean, music I mean, when studio. You, when you look at uh, using NWA as an example, yeah. like they're saying something. It's about that experience. But then when you again re- replicate, 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 and you have the, the sort of caricature of N-word, 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 scantily clad women, and that's sort of that. Becomes when somebody this, goes, this, that's what's selling. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Right. If no, somebody came to up to me and goes, preach that thing you did right there, that's, right. that's what's selling. I'm going right. to modify Well, that. you know what? Yeah. The game's down. That's right. I can't do that anymore. That's You'll right. never, yeah. You will never see it again because I don't trust you with that content. Mm-hmm. I can't trust you to walk out in the street, quote unquote, with my words, and tell it to somebody else. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing about N.W.A., which I thought was really, really missed in that movie, mm. is the evolution of Ice Cube going, wait a minute, we're making this money. You're taking authentic content and you're doing whatever you want to. Yeah. And the breakdown of, did you sign the paper? No. Nah. It was, it, yeah. because he's seeing it's like, wait a minute, is anyone else seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah. Which was 
beautiful and it was it was it was, it was amazingly articulated. I mean, his song was a diss record, No Vaseline. Yeah, yeah. there's a part in there. It's like, whoo wee! I can't believe that made that made it on the record because he's talking about how the industry gets in and breaks up communities. It's also a little uh, allusion to it alluded a little bit to how crack got in and broke up the community. So I mean, when you start looking at that, just the little pieces. You know, I didn't like N.W.A. initially because, like, man, this is first. I didn't think they could rap. I think it was going. Then I heard a couple of lyrics. I'm like, he's saying something there. Yeah. He's saying something there. See, the thing these days is people grow into this space where I need people to know I'm saying something. Like, I need attention hmm. for what I'm saying because that gets me attention. Right. So, well, listen. If you can't say it to the to, to the valet downstairs, the dude on the corner, it ain't real. You know, I don't need an audience yeah. to be real. And it's like that's the thing. It's like yeah. we don't need. You know, Muslim comedy is very clickish right now. Because mm. mm. I need so and so. We need to group over here, and we're gonna make it. And I'm like, yo, that's not that's not the game. You know, my whole idea about Muslim comedy, and I won't be long. My whole Muslim, my whole idea about Muslim comedy was not me going through the front door and being a star. Yeah. My whole idea of Muslim comedy was taking my community through the door and go, those are the stars. We have stars all around. Shine the spotlight on these people because they mean something. They have value. I mean, my job is to get you to the door and then get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think I think part of the problem, and this isn't exclusive to the Muslim sure. comedy sphere, but I think in general we have a trend uh, um, within the Muslim community of people realizing that that label Muslim is something they can commodify and turn it into a, a, a paycheck. Just, just say what it is, man. The label Muslim, you can pimp it. And the, yeah. label, and the label Muslim is being pimped. Right. I mean, you, you don't agree with that? Well, well who... I'm not thinking of anyone in... in no, no, no. I'm not trying to think of anyone in particular but I, either. I, I, I but pimp it to who? Like, who? who, who well, there, there's, value, there's value in being the Muslim ex, right? And and I, I think I think what, what Preacher was saying earlier about the idea of you let one in and that keeps the other ones out, I think I think there's a remarkable amount of truth to that because I think that's that's very apt. And I think that's not just applicable to Muslims. I think when you look at... Yeah, yeah. Well, because he was saying that experience comes from, like, uh, saying... Yeah, the Jews. People would say about, about Jewish people. Sure. Yeah. You but, know? Sorry. Okay. Because I'm fascinated by this. But, I mean, I just, I just... I think that what what we're seeing now... I mean, because you're talking about the role of Muslim artists and whether you can be a Muslim artist or an artist who happens to be Muslim and, and sort of the fluidity yeah. there. I think I think... Uh, a lot of people are realizing that there's value in putting yourself out there as the Muslim X, and you're pushing and, being, and, and you're being push, the only one. Yeah, or being one of the few, and you're pushing certain boundaries that certainly aren't normally expected or, uh, uh, from a Muslim, and so that you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that's and fascinating. I'm not, and by, just because I'm not sitting here in judgment of anybody, right? Okay. But this is certainly something right. I'm, I've because I'm putting this in, the, in my world, right? I'm translating this into my world, so I think at a law firm, let's say, right? And I'm the sole or one of the few Muslim partners or brown partners at the law firm, right? Suddenly, this up-and-coming brown associate who happens to be Muslim, happens to be brown, whatever, um, is coming up the ranks. I feel threatened. Yeah, sure. I feel threatened because, hey, I am yeah. the sole brown you know, Muslim th- there's, there's a movie. Uh, partner at the law firm. There's there's like, a movie called Not Another Teen Movie. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a parody of yeah, like teen, of teen movies. Teeny Bob Brown movies. So there's a, there's like a part- Chris, Chris Chris Evans. Chris Evans. Evans. Evans like right. yeah, yeah. So so there's a scene. It's like the party scene, right? Okay. And it's a big party and whatever. And um, you've got like the 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 token black character in the yeah. movie, and he's at the party, and he sees there's a, another black guy there. Yeah. And he's like, hey man. I'm the black guy in this movie. And he's like, oh, really? Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Oh, my bad. And he leaves, right? right. And obviously, it's it's making a point of the idea that that within these realms, you have mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. have the designated 
black, black person, person. Yeah. the designated Hispanic person. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Right. And so there's a sense of like, well, if you're going to tag somebody in, you got to tag out. <laughs> yeah, know? no. That's Alonzo it. Bolton does a joke about. Uh, oh, he's so funny. Doing. Uh, he went to Alaska. Okay. And uh, he met the black guy in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, "Are you here to relieve me?" <laughs> Or something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and I mean, but there, 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 there's, uh, I think one of the most dynamic dudes is out there right now. Um, they talk about him, they're not talking about him enough. And this is from an pers- artist's perspective, but also from a Muslim artist's perspective. It, it's, the, um, it's the phenomena of, of Brother Ali. Hmm. And I love Brother Ali. And I'm like, I love that brother. I'm like, but the yeah. world is going to catch up to you probably too. Yeah. 20 years after you're gone, man. Hmm. I'm like, he's he's on that level. Yeah. And I'm and like, yet. I'm an old school dude. And he's like, I appreciate you. You know how he is. I appreciate you, an old school dude. And you're my big brother. And I'm like, yo, man, I've been checking you out for a minute. Mm-hmm. I was like, game recognizes game. I'm like, Psh. you know, I was like, I see what you're doing. And it's amazing. Because here's a guy who's like, I'm just going to walk my path. Hmm. And we just don't... That's true Muslim. I'm just going to walk my path, yeah, man. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm like, we don't have that. We have formulaic understanding of how you can be successful in this thing. So if you want to be on Comedy Central, these are things you got to do. If you want to yeah. be on Netflix, these are things you got to do. Right, right, right. My, my father's like, you know, I told him to do a comedy special. because you like on Netflix? Oh, yeah. I said, no, sir. <laughs> he goes, why? I said... I'm telling a lot of truth, man. That's it. I don't think Netflix... Hmm. That's it. I don't think most people can handle some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. It's because it's real. It's coming from a real mm-hmm. place. I'm like, hey, man, you know, you know, you strip down jokes, but you know what you get. You're going to get some truth. You're going to get that hot. You know, and it's like when you start understanding, as we were talking earlier, the thing about it made me funny, I, I, I mentioned it. It was meant to pull African-American... Indian people together mm-hmm. together it's like this is this is gonna be something that our kids can look at and go wow that really happened and while it happened now you really don't you really don't hear much about it it's flossed over you know I'm so and so I'm doing this now are you really doing it now it's, 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 it's a different piece man and I think also when we, we first did it, and this is one of the things, man, my work in Muhammad, appreciate it. I said, we are, this is a protest, this is a protest comedy for the things that we were seeing after, directly after 9-11. I said, but it's also to highlight the meaningful and valuable contributions of African-American Muslims mm-hmm. in the history of African Muslims, of Muslims in America. Mm-hmm. Everyone forgets that part. Yeah. Everyone forgets that part. You know, your your point about Brother Ali, I think, beautifully articulates what I was trying to say in my in a very inarticulate manner about what my, my thoughts on art and Muslim art in general. Because take Brother Ali, right? I, I I've been to a Brother Ali concert, right? It says it's as pure and authentic of a hip hop experience as you're going to get. Right? Mm-hmm. But you're at it. But you're in a setting. You're in a particular space, and we can you know. There's certain things going on in that space, right? Without calling it out, certain things that I would argue Muslim orthodoxy, the naysayers, uh, the critics of that art form, are going to say, "Oh no, this is harm. You can't. This is this is unlawful. This is not appropriate. This is this is wrong." And yet, you're in, you're in this space. You're at this quintessentially hip hop American experience, and Brother Ali closes the show out with. The audience saying Ya Salam, Ya Quddus, Ya Hafiz, like saying the names of God, literally, saying Allahu, La ilaha illallah, so on and so forth, and and so you have that happening as well, and yet what I'm saying is that is that that's a beautiful phenomenon that's happening, but it is something that the naysayers, those who say, well, no, 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 this is haram, this is wrong, are going to. The thing, the thing, the thing, I think the thing is as being, you know what I mean, as being repugnant. Period. I think the thing is, if you took Brother Ali out of that setting and put him in a quote unquote, yeah, yeah, yeah. setting, yeah. he'd be just as effective. 
I agree. I agree. <laughs> I'm, I'm not disagreeing. I'm not disagreeing. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm but, right. But, right. But the fact of the matter is, those people yeah. that we're talking about, yeah. they're afraid. They're afraid to say, "Hey, listen, come over. Give us that over here." Right. They're afraid because you lose control. Right. You know, because you've been saying no, 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 no for so many years, and somebody go, oh. someone goes, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, then it works. They invalidate. Hmm. You know, they, it, it, it's like, okay, cool. Right. Why should I listen to you the next time? Hmm. Wow. Well, I think uh, that's a good place to leave right. this discussion. Oh my gosh, we yeah. covered we, the gamut. We, we covered the game. Hmm. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, real quick, as we wind things yeah. up, uh, are there any any upcoming things that you have uh, coming up? That uh, I taped a comedy CD uh, last week called "Confessions of a Muslim Comedian," which will dig into that. It'll be sort of like a, a comedy playbook. Parts of it are stand up. Parts of it is like I'm just going to give you the game. Um, and then I really actually I was out in California two weeks ago. Um, I did a very, very important Eid show. Um, I did an Eid show at uh, Solano Prison. Wow. In uh, Vacaville, California. Um, you weren't I, too far from here. I did two shows Beautiful. for Eid. The uh, first show, 80 inmates, Muslim. Yeah, yeah. second show was like 150 inmates, Muslim. Hmm. And then all this craziness I had to say, man, uh, it's... What does it say that you have to go to prison to get your mind right? I had to go to prison to get my mind right. That's right. Like I like felt at home. Like <sighs> was that was that your first time like kind of going? No, I've done it before. I, right. I what was it about that experience? First of all, I felt guilty because I'd done it in two thousand three, mm -hmm. and I'd never gone back in fifteen years. Mm -hmm. Realizing that these guys, you know, when you have a guy that's doing, you know, he's been in life up for forty years. He's a uh, LWAP, uh, life without parole. Guy goes, man, I ain't laughed like that in 40 years. You realize he's been in jail. You know, he, he came in when he was 20. That's right. He's 60 years old. He's going, I haven't laughed like that in 40 years. And I'm like, what, what, are we, what are we talking about? I'm like, why does Trump matter? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> like, what, what are we really, really talking about? Right. So, right. I mean, that's, that's real. But I think we have to define our own realness mm -hmm. uh, away from... Instagram away from Facebook yeah. and, and Tumblr and Twitter and you know shut those things down and, and let's come up with some authentic organic ideas I mean we're, we're people of a book man we're oral tradition man we know how to talk we know how to you know it's not a brother I know that took the shahada mm -hmm. we didn't hear of uh, Bismillah and Rahim and it didn't sound like a, a hit Motown tune you know it's something that just resonates with brothers like right. you know, I was like, where's that love, man? Are you in prison? And you hear a brother talking about, brothers, we just get our life right. And we get get out of here, what's in this book, and apply it. And you, you're inspired, but that's the brother that's never getting out. I was like, you know, we can't. We want to be able to serve that brother, but we can't become that brother. You know, we can't mm -hmm. become the thing that we're fighting against. Because we're not stepping up or engaging what we call the beast if you will so I mean you know, those 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 are real things I mean I'm, I'm back to a space at 51 I'm just walking that path now you know, so normally this is where I ask if you're on social media but that would just feel incredibly inappropriate I now, am so. I am I try <laughs> I'm one of those social media triers like you know I have Instagram I don't think I've done Twitter and I can't, I can't really do Twitter and, and Facebook is a lot I don't like the sign on that's my problem with Facebook it's just too much signing on yeah. um, there's some things I put out on Instagram but it's just real you know it's real stuff but I'm not a dude it's like I gotta be out here every every five minutes I gotta be putting something up yeah right so that probably diminishes my uh, my potencies as as an Instagram, as an influencer. <laughs> as well, man, I mean, well, you know what it is, man. I've seen influencers before. Mm. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I've seen influencers before. I remember, I remember meeting Muhammad Ali, and I didn't want to be a boxer. I just wanted to be a good black strong man. Huh. 
I didn't want to be a boxer. I knew I was going to be a boxer. I said, yeah. I just want to be a strong black man. See, those are the yeah, yeah, yeah. things that you yeah. miss, you know? Yeah. Right, right. Never met Malcolm X, but I'm like, there's a purity to what he's saying, man. Yeah. You know? He's a convict, but there's a purity to what he's saying. That's what we were talking about. Solano Prison. It's like, you, you, you can't overlook that. It's like, hmm. I, I, I'll wrap this up. There's a purity to the message and the mission and the character dissemination of the Vasula, peace and blessings being upon him, but I never met him. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. I remember when someone told me and I did some reading, they said, what do you think? I said, yo, man, it's a bad man. <laughs> hmm. Not, I love him. Yeah. It's a yeah. bad dude. Yeah, no, you're it's right. There's a bad man. there. There's a bad man. He's a good man, but he's a bad man because he's relevant to me. Because he's a prophet, but... Hey man, we gotta get out and have a war. We gotta get out and have a war. Let's 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 get to it. Hmm. It's like this isn't working. This is where we're gonna be. Let's go and get to it. Mm-hmm. You bring your guys. I bring my guys. You know that's the realness. You know. Hmm. So like we talk about Mandela, but like yo, Mandela was a freedom fighter. Don't get it. You know with the white hair and hello everybody. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah, but the dudes, dudes like if I gotta if I gotta kill you, I kill you. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not advocating violence. I'm not advocating violence, I'm not advocating aggression, but I am advocating intellectual process and intelligence. Mm-hmm. And like you, some days you gotta be willing to go there. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, 51, I'm more than willing to go there. So how about a website at least where people can maybe... It's not a construction, but go, okay. to, go to okay. PreacherMoss.com. There you go. PreacherMoss.com. Um, thank you so much. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I... I I gotta ask this just on a yes, sir. personal question. Preacher, the name. Yes. Tell us about that before you close this out. Wow. Um, or before I'm, I'm gonna hand it over to Zucky to close this out. No, my mother was a church lady. Ah. So she. So that was your birth name. No, 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 no. Oh. My slave name. That's all black guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. My slave name is is Bryant Moss. Okay. Is Bryant Moss. Bryant. B R Y A N T. Okay. Okay. Now, Bryant. look, just for the record, I mean, no, actually, don't feel shy about that. We've had Imam Siraj on, we've had Imam Zaid on, they've uh, all told, told us their quote unquote slave names. I know, so, yeah. you know. But how, but how deep Don't is worry that? about it. How deep is that? This is America, this is the, the land of democracy. But you got a whole culture of African Americans still walking around with their slave names. <laughs> it's deep. We don't even think about it. Yeah. That's how. Damn, man. That's two o'clock. <laughs> right. <laughs> so was then. So then. You know, my name preacher uh, comes from is it's a nickname. First of all, okay. What it was, my mother used to take me to church, and you know, the black kids we had to go to church on Sunday, and essentially, the reverend's name was Reverend John Johnson the third. Nice guy, horrible public speaker. I don't think those things really bounce off. Right. Your minister and your horrible public speaker. You're in the, you're in the wrong and I mean, he would give these painfully bad sermons. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid. I'm six, seven years old. I used to do imitations of him giving bad so, sermons. Uh-huh. And I came up with a character for him called Reverend Spitty Mouth. Uh-huh. <laughs> so he, like, preached and spit. And the Lord said, uh, like, yeah, yeah. and he said, come to Jesus. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it would crack up all the kids. So eventually I went from. You know, Reverend spit him out to that kid preacher moss. Mm, nice. So oh, be careful, funny. careful what you ask for. Right, right. <laughs> That's really funny. It's like your mom used to say, like, be good, you know, if you make that face, it's gonna stick. You know, it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, if you do that, yeah. and the Lord said, <laughs> That's it. and then he became preacher moss. Dude, he was so horrible one time. He was, you know how, you know how they they'll slide a message. He was going through the Bible and they slide and send a message, and he goes. <laughs> And the Lord John said, "You got five minutes." Left. And, goes, and the Lord John says, "License plate two seven eight eight nine. You're blocking the handicap parking, please." I'm like, "That's not in the Bible, man." <laughs> I know I'm only this seven. The new New Testament. I know I'm only seven, but that's not in the Bible, there. The new, but, new but I mean, that that's it, man. So, hey, man, I want to thank you guys, and uh, hopefully, I didn't offend anybody because sometimes the game can be ugly. Yeah. No, no, we're going to have you back. Yeah, yeah, this was just a start, and we've been wanting to have this conversation for the longest time. Um, Zucky, maybe tell tell our listeners where people can find us and support uh, us. uh, Yes, please go to our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash Diffusing Grooms. And you can also uh, hit like on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Diffusing Grooms, as well as uh, you can email us at moviefilm.com. 
No, that's that's my other podcast. I have so many. You can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also email us at moviefilmpodcast.com, but topics unrelated to this show. What are you, Jamaican man? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen podcasts. He, he's, he's got a lot of product to hustle. He's, 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 he's got six he of them going right now. It's, it's yeah, exactly. Go, where's Zachy? I'm like, what of, show am I doing he's here? He's got a lot of product to hustle. He's, got, he's, he's, he's hustle. got he's got one microphone and sixteen hidden. <laughs> That's right. Some Jamaican down there go, "Bah, what man? Zachy's on, but he's talking a ting. <laughs> he's telling a ting now. Bah, what he he's telling a ting on Trump." <laughs> Boy, tell a thing on, tell a thing now. <laughs> but why you say tell it, tell a thing? <laughs> so that's uh, that's our email address. Yeah. And uh, Pervez is on Twitter. Yep. Uh, what, what, yeah. Yeah, Pervez FM. Okay. And yeah. and I'm at uh, Zeki's Corner, Z A K I S Corner, and that's my website, just at dot com. And uh, we will catch you next time. Thanks everybody for listening. Okay, so long.